Hello, I'm Associate Professor Deirdre Howard Wagner. I'm from the Australian National University. I'm giving a paper at the City and Complexity Conference on life design and commerce in the built environment in London on the paper titled Cities and the Complexities of Indigenous Displacement in the Neoliberal Age. In this paper, I will explore the city as a complex space of Indigenous displacement, focusing on the city of Newcastle or the Australian city of Newcastle. Before I begin, I wish to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose land this presentation is being recorded. So I'm presently located in Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory, and this is the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. I wish to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land and acknowledge the important contribution that they make to the Ngunnawal nation, the region, and the Australian National University. And I also wish to acknowledge the Awabigal people on whose land this presentation is about. So I'm going to be talking to you about the city of Newcastle, and that is the traditional land of the Awabigal people, or it's a Awabigal nation. I wish to acknowledge the important contribution that they make to Awabigal nation, the city of Newcastle and the region. Given the short time that we have, I'm going to limit my presentation to the city of Newcastle. And to begin with, I want to contextualize this city as a city of a, a, a settler colonial city, as a British settler colonial city a city of displacement, of original act of displacement and dispossession um, of the Awabical people. And so this map here sort of gives you a bit of a sense of the land and the different nations. So we've got Awabical nation, Waramai nation, Dark and Young nation, and Wanarua nation. And so Newcastle is on the nation, Awabical nation. And just, so the um, blue line going up here is a river called Coquin River. Well, the hunter now called hunter river, but it's Coquin, um, the Wabakal word for it. And so on to the south of the river is Newcastle, to the north of the river is Waramai, and to the west of the river is Minda River Nation. So in 1804, what was to become the Australian city of Newcastle, which was two hours north of the city of Sydney, became a harsh penal colony for convict recidivists who worked on extracting coal from the banks of the Coquin River, later to become, under settler colonialism, the Hunter River. The region was already occupied. The Wabakal First Nations people occupied what later came to be known as the Newcastle region on, as I said, the southern side of the river. The Wabakal people initially coexisted with the penal settlement established on the river until the 1820s. And Newcastle's status as a penal settlement prevented large grants in the area. So there, there wasn't large land grants in the area. In 1826, the first Bardabar mission in Australia was set up by Reverend Thor Crowell. So we had a mission and reserve system that sort of came about in Australia. And this is the first Aboriginal mission in Australia. So this is part of the beginning of displacement of First Nations peoples from their nation. And the first people, First Nations peoples to be displaced um, other than the Sydney um, Aboriginal communities was the, um, the Awabakal peoples. And the, first, the Awabakal First Nations peoples were gathered up and contained within the side of the mission. And the Awabakal First Nations peoples language was documented and published by Reverend Thrill in 1827, making it the first First Nations language to be written down. In successive years, as the land of Badaba Mission too became valuable, the Wabakal First Nations people were again displaced and dispersed. And, doc and this is documented as a result of the rapid decrease in numbers. The Wabakal First Nations peoples and other First Nations people coexisted in Newcastle. And there has been considerable recovery over the last 60 years. Today, however, the processes of urban neoliberal transformation continue to produce displacement and estrangement from public spaces, land and political policy processes. And in this paper, I'm going to explore a case study of the urban neoliberal transformation along the foreshore of the Australian city of Newcastle, illustrating the forms of urban indigenous displacement it produces. Very just a snapshot. And this is uh, an extract from a book I'm working on, Indigenous Invisibility in the City, that should come out with Routledge next year. And so really this is a chapter that looks at the um, urban displacement it produces from 
um, development in the, in the present, present moment. So it considers urban indigenous displacement as a complex place-based phenomenon, variegated by historical, geographical, sociological and legal contexts. And cities have a long history of evicting, displacing, invisibilising, regulating indigenous peoples. Um, Shireen Razak talks about this, um, Evelyn Peters, I, um, Chris Anderson, uh, Julia Tomiak. Um, so, you know, there's a, a whole history around the cities, the settler colonial city as a place of displacement. Simultaneously, First Nations people have a long history of engaging in cultural surgeons and employing strategies to contest being displaced in and through the settler colonial city, including making land claims, renaming streets, reclaiming public spaces, establishing self-governing institutions and organisations, building communities and creating social infrastructure and delivering their own services to address the complex disadvantage in Indigenous peoples experience, again as a result of displacement and dispossession, so historical displacement and dispossession. And so we're talking about this history of displacement but also processes of recovery and then ongoing processes of, of displacement so this displacement recovery displacement recovery um, so when the, and this i want to take us to a particular moment in newcastle's history so newcastle is a very much a, a industrial city so the post-world war ii period was a very industrial period in newcastle post-world two world war ii so it became a very industrial city because it's got coal, um, some important coal mines. It was a big coal city. Um, and in 1999, the major steelworks, the um, BHP Steelworks, which is a major industry, closed. And the Australian city of Newcastle, to, in, you know, in terms of readjusting its economy, um, launched into a new century as a post-industrial city. And it ended an era of heavy industry. So while it remained a major Australian coal mining and export hub, it was to transform from a working class former steelworks town into a smart, livable and sustainable global city. The purpose of urban renewal has been to facilitate Newcastle economic survival in the post-industrial 21st century and the neoliberal age. And Newcastle's competitive edge is its waterfront foreshore. Now this waterfront foreshore was a very industrial foreshore historically, and you can see this, and even the river was a very historical foreshore. So this competitive edge is about its waterfront and its cultural activities of young artists and the heterotopic festival spaces that they created in this city around this time. And so festivals like This Is Not Art, Cultural Stomp, Shootout, which is a um, film and photography festival, young film and photography festival, and other events really sort of transformed the city into a cultural space. And within 11 years, Newcastle would become one of the Lonely Planet's top 10 global travel destinations. And like Perth and New Canberra, Newcastle's planners and local government set about bringing people back into the abandoned city of empty shop fronts. So Newcastle also, uh, its economy had weakened, the city had been um, suburbanised, so you know, more shopping malls had sort of seen the spread of shops out into the suburbs and there'd be suburban growth. So the city had also been quite depleted and there was a lot of sort of abandoned city of empty shop fronts. And the city created three distinct cultural precincts, including the existing civic and cultural precinct with some very significant heritage buildings, very beautiful old heritage buildings that have been built um, in, in Newcastle's cultural precinct. There was the foreshore, which would have been the, the industrial foreshore, and then also the University of Newcastle, which was actually out further. Um, it also had a, um, a city campus, and that was also to be revitalised, that cultural, the city campus was to be revitalised. So new public spaces were commercialised and urban renewal saw 50 hectares of uninhabitable habited um, Dockland reclaimed as foreshore living, like at Liverpool and Manchester in the United Kingdom. So here we see what the the foreshore actually looked. It was very much an industrial um, dock, you know, um, you know, where the you know a harbour dock for you know sending resources out in in major shipping. Um, so it was a, a shipping dock, and um, 
This 50 hectares of uninhabited industrial dockland was reclaimed as foreshore living. And the transformation of Newcastle was sent around replacing the um, wasteland of heavy industry, including railway workshop, wool stores, cargo sheds, and warehouses along the Hunter or Newcastle Hunter River, Coquin River, uh, foreshore, with new multi story residential commercial buildings with ground floor retail and restaurant spaces. So, we've got mixed purpose buildings like the foreshore with between 10 and 20 metres of public space between the buildings and the riverfront. So, the riverfront becomes a very important. Um, activity space as well, a community public space, major transformation as well. And cultural revival and associated commodified activities were central to the process in Newcastle. So the Honeysuckle Development, as it's known, formerly known, has been funded with $100 million from the Commonwealth State Building Better Cities Program. And the formerly disused foreshore was rejuvenated significantly and it's now the city's harbour front playground. Uh, that's sort of in quotes, and that's sort of from Newcastle now in 2019. And alongside the Honeysuckle Precinct is the City and Cultural Precincts, which itself has gone through major um, urban transformations as well. So we've got this Newcastle and, and the Harbour. And this area here too, the City Centre Precinct, has gone through some major transformations as well. And along, so we've got these, um, and so there's now this new light rail coming through down the side here of the the city centre, um, and there's a buzz of activity along Newcastle's Hunter Street, the main street. So the development of the foreshore has played out in really complex ways with First Nations people. So you can see the, the major transformation on this slide here. The campus site for the Newcastle University, um, and sort of, you know, this sort of, um, the foreshore waterfront with, you know, apartment blocks, and then you can see this sort of, promenade where um, is the public space that people can now use along the foreshore. So this development of the foreshore has played out in complex ways with First Nations people as it entailed a certain commodifications of the city's his indigenous history and presence in the Awabigal culture value adds to the city. And it has also created new forms of indigenous displacement because the excavation of many of the development sites have, has unearthed significant First Nation Awabical artefacts and new forms of indigenous and agency and resistance have arisen out of such processes. So it, it's created this sort of level of um, complexity around indigenous displacement. And the Awabical local land counts, Aboriginal land councils placed a number of land claims over the foreshore areas, including the Newcastle port entrance and the Newcastle Wickham rail corridor, which sort of comes down this area here in between. And, um, and when it was about to build um, the Newcastle, or what we call local Aboriginal land council put in a claim over the area. But also too, public art and signage and recognition of a call place names value add to the cultural precinct and along the, floor, the foreshore. So occasional reference to what we call occupation and history can be found on a few official interpretive signs along detailed white histories at local monuments. So if one catches the ferry across from the harbour from Newcastle to Stockton across the Coquin River, one's attention or Hunter River may be drawn to the decorative sign with the word Malabimba written on it. And Malabimba is the illogical name for Newcastle. Walking along the newly drenchified Honeysuckle Precinct foreshore, you may notice the public art shaped in the form of cement ships with illogical place names carved into them alongside sort of, you know, so this history and, and alongside the words of, you know, the convict settlers and the, um, you know, the industrial um, dock language. So also you might notice um, walking along the Honeysuckle Precinct foreshore, you may trigger the sensor and the smart technology used to capture recordings that pronounce the awabical words for landmarks as you pass signs listing awabical names for landmarks including the harbour and the river and traditional stories of each place. At the end of Honeysuckle Precinct on the corner of Stewart and Avenue and Hunter Street you will see the mural painted by Melbourne artist Matt Last. It is an image of Auntie June Rose with her granddaughter Nayeli Green. 
And the mural was unveiled in December 2018, 25 years after Newcastle City Council signed a commitment to Indigenous Australians. And part of that commitment was the recognition of place names and, and, and signage and, and the changing of awabical words or, you know, um, place names for awabical words. And this itself has been highly contested because it's taken 25 years for these initiatives to sort of come to fruition and they still haven't sort of reached the level that First Nations peoples would like or envisaged when they made this sort of agreement with the Newcastle City Council 25 years ago. So in this image, um, it reflects the, the passing of, on of culture generation to generation and Auntie June Rose. She's also the main subject of the artwork in recognition of her decades of volunteer service. She's performed as one of the founders of a really critical organisation in Newcastle, which is the Awabakal um, Cooperative or the New Awabakal Newcastle Aboriginal Cooperative, as it was first called. Um, it's now Awabakal Limited. Um, and that's, that was for, uh, created in 1975 to support, um, you know, sort of, uh, cultural resurgence in the city uh, and for people moving, uh, First Nations people moving to Newcastle from uh, northern and western New South Wales, um, sort of as po the post war, World War II relocation programs. Um, and so that itself is an important part of that sort of history of displacement and recovery. The Wabakal Cooperative itself has an important history around um, recovery from displacement. So the mural also incorporates into its backdrop the art of Raymond Kelly Jr., Miss Rose's grandson, and, um, and the backdrop painted by Raymond Kelly Jr. Um, also shows some significant, um, you know, it depicts the lakes and rivers and oceans of the Newcastle region. Um, and and um, the word thirumul, mum, is written in large letters on the top left-hand corner of the mural, and it, which means the brown tree keeper. And that has a significance in itself. It's a type of woodpecker, but in the language of the Awabakal people, it's a women's spiritual totem. So it's a really significant to the women of Awabakal women. It's a spiritual totem. And the main Awabakal totem of the area, so you'll see it over in the left-hand corner, is um, the eagle hawk. And, um, the, or the wedge-tailed eagle, which has a special significance for the Awabakal people. Um, and it's a significant totem. It's also depicted in this, um, this mural. The revitalisation of public place or space in Newcastle is not only cast as a place to remember, but also a place to recognise the ongoing connection uh, First Nations peoples to the city and their significant place within the city. So public art signage and recognition of place names is a gesture towards recognition and, and brings First Nations people back and Mobical Nation back into place and, and onto the land. Uh, and it brings Wobbical people and First Nations people onto the land they were historically banished from, making visible First Nations people's relationship with and to the place in present moment. So Wobbical Nation and First Nations people become visible in their own territory once again. The signage and public art along the foreshore has not come easily and their presence also obscures the wider dynamic taking place between First Nations peoples and the city. And in 2001, Newcastle City Council built Bathers Way, a walk along the, the coastal foreshore of Newcastle's major beaches. And in the lead up to building the site, the Gurukai Committee, which is the Aboriginal Advisory Committee that advises council, informed the council that they there was a significant Awabakal history to the, of connection to the area depicted in a number of Awabakal stories, and it recommended the council provide interpretation signs that inform users and visitors of those stories and, and the significance of those signs. A large interpretive sign at Nobby's Beach marking Bathers Way was erected, and it said in that sign that Nobby's Island was created in the dreaming by a dreaming stories by the great rainbow serpent as it pushed itself onto the land after it had dropped from the sky into the ocean. The difficulty was that the signage was wrong. Pan Aboriginal myths were substituted for local Awabakal dreaming stories. And this visible signs of this reconciliatory act masked how the development of the foreshore has played out in complex ways for First Nations peoples. So 
this Curry discourse has rendered dominant accounts of history or um, First Nations people's discourse has rendered dominant accounts of history as problematic uh, through an effective history and through resistance, exampling how the story is, of some is not the story of others. So there had to be sort of this rectification of signage um, to remove this sort of pan-Aboriginal myth from this signage. Paradoxically, while Newcastle's foreshore development has made visible a Wobbical history, language and place names, it also desecrated a Wobbical sites and artefact in the development of that foreshore, that 50 hectares. And the redevelopment of post-industrial Newcastle has created new forms of displacement, is an, a site of struggle and sources of territorial contestation and conflict. The excavation of many of the development sites along the Honeysuckle has unearthed significant First Nation Awabical artefacts. The Ibis Hotel, the Kentucky Fried Chicken Fast Food Restaurant, the new um, Inner City University site and the Newcastle Light Rail Corridor are all separate sites on the main street along the city foreshore where significant awabical artefacts such as stone tools and campsite remains have been discovered during the excavation phase of development. The site in which Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, fast food restaurant is now located on Hunter Street is one of the most, country's most significant cultural heritage sites. And this is a quote from the Newcastle Herald in 2011. The restaurant was built on at 684 Hunter Street on the former Empire Palais Royal site. Now this site itself has a really uh, significant history um, of displacement as well. Um, and, you know, the Palais had been demolished in 2008 after it was damaged and sustained during the 1989 earthquake and a severe storm and hit and flooded Newcastle in 2007. It was a very severe storm that created a lot of damage and flooding in Newcastle. So this is earthquake and then this flooding. And so the Palais was sort of a ball, uh, was demolished and, and sold the site to the Newcastle City Council owned the site. In 2011, archeologists recovered over 5,534 obical artifacts representing three Aboriginal occupation periods dating from 6,716 to 6,502 years before present. And they identify the site of high to exceptional cultural and scientific significance, drawing on historical paintings to identify the site connections with the Wabigal people at the time of colonisation. So, you know, this site of the Palais was also, you know, the Wabigal people had been removed from that land and, you know, that was a significant site of removal and placed on the first government mission. And then that site became a government farm. And so, you know, that it's a significant site that became a government farm, then a meatworks, later an elite skating rink, and then later the Empire Palais Royal Dance Hall was built on it. And now there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant on it. So this sort of, you know, this ongoing displacement of this site and the building over, um, so despite the existence of significant awabical artefacts, the construction of Kentucky Fried Chicken Restaurant went ahead and next door to the Ibis Hotel, which also has been built on awabical artefacts. And it continues what Colin Tatz refers to as this erasure of known history. And so, or a whiting out of the past, maintaining indigenous invisibility in the neoliberal age. So in 2001, on that same site of the Ibis Hotel was built on, there was a comprehensive archaeological test and salvage excavation at 700 Hunter Street, and they found a large number of Aboriginal stone artefacts, including upwards of 4,000 flaked stone artefacts. And a report of this suggested that the excavation site evidence demonstrated the place was subject to repeated Aboriginal visitation and the use in the past for a range of purposes, including tool manufacture, maintenance and or replacement, along with a range of other activities, including food procurement, consumption and discard. And the settler colonial city not only engaged in an act of erasure, building Western architecture over a Wobbical artifact, but it also economically benefited from this act. And the Awabical people did not benefit. So, the, so disrupting the excavation of the sites containing Awabical artifacts and the broader economic benefits associated with their destruction, the Wabical Local Aboriginal Land Council placed a number of land claims over the foreshore area, including the Newcastle Port Entrance and the Newcastle Wickham Rail Corridor. 
uh, where the new light rail infrastructure was to be built. As the then CEO of the Awabakal Local Aboriginal Land Council stated, yeah, this was not in quote, not a land grab, local Aboriginal people were simply using the right land rights legislation to claim back land and more that has been taken from them when white settlement occurred, unquote. So while claiming the rail corridor was to protect the significant Awabakal sites, claiming control of Newcastle's harbour entrance concerned financial dependent, independence for local First Nations peoples. And the, flame, the claim made visible how laws pertaining to both Aboriginal land rights and Aboriginal cultural heritage protection and economically compensating First Nations people for dispossession and displacement, highlighting how local First Nations people continue to be invisible in relation to, quote, the millions of dollars in royalties from coal source from traditional lands and exported through the port, unquote. So the land claim drew attention to the contemporary paradox of urban transformation in the neoliberal age and displacement, illustrating how it was produced indigenous displacement from the land and economic processes. It continues to perpetuate the historical injustice of the economics of settler colonialism in that the flow of development and capital continues to feed the economy of the coloniser while continuing to displace First Nations peoples. So thank you for joining me today in my presentation on um, uh, complexities of um, cities and the complexities of Indigenous placement in neoliberal age with my case study of Newcastle. So thank you. Goodbye.